Welcome, Kai, and thank you again for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be once again on an academy. It's been a while. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about porting user applications to Qt6. So the focus is a bit on user applications. Um, you heard yesterday, if you have been joining yesterday, uh, an update about uh, the KD frameworks and that they are also working on this and so on. But uh, this is not, you know, the talk in that sense isn't KD specific because, to be honest, there would be others who would be probably much more uh, into the current state of things. Uh, but kind of what it takes in general to uh, port a Qt uh, five traditional uh, application to Qt six. All right. I hope you can all hear me fine. If not, scream. So yeah, when preparing the slides, actually on Friday, a colleague kind of a completely different presentation talked to me and said, you know, all the technical presentations often miss the why. So I was adding this uh, uh, this this slide on last second. Um, so why Qt6? Why porting to Qt6? Um, and um, to be honest, Qt6 is in a lot of ways just the logical um, kind of uh, conclusion or going forward from Qt5. So from times to times inside Qt, we just decide, okay, you know, there is enough uh, architectures to be changed that we don't really want to do in minor changes, uh, minor patch sets. Uh, there is enough, you know, deprecated API now that we want to do a clear cut and actually get rid of deprecated API. And, you know, also do, uh, yeah, just architectural stuff uh, like updating the C++ version and so on. And then it's kind of the discussion starts. And then we say at one point, okay, that's that should be actually a next major version. So in that sense, it's like logical conclusion from Qt5. On a very high level view, uh, what we want to aim with Qt6, what you can expect also in the next years to come is, well, I mean, world is changing. We are looking to new platforms. Um, also architectures like the whole Mac OS and ARM thing is going on. Um, the other side of the coin is uh, graphics. There is a lot of development there where, for instance, I don't know, with Qt5, we did a bit of a bet on OpenGL and the whole Qt Quick story was built on, on top of OpenGL. Now we are in a completely different landscape where there is Vulkan and Metal and probably more DirectX uh, coming uh, and evolving. So that also requires some bigger changes inside Qt. Qt Quick is an ongoing thing since years. Uh, also since Qt5 released, we have been learning a lot how to also write bigger applications with Qt Quick. The challenges that comes with that, uh, with the current Qt Quick integration in terms of tooling, uh, in terms of you know maintaining bigger applications. So there is a lot of going on there to make this better. Um, and yeah, on the strictly C++ side, you know, uh, there's been discussions about whether our current containers are still good enough, how to want to evolve them, that we have some API that we, you know, don't want to advocate anymore or, or let people use anymore, um, and so on. So that's all good reasons for Qt6. If you are interested in particularly that, like the bigger picture, I can only refer uh, you maybe to the talk by Lars Knoll uh, next Wednesday, I believe. Um, where he will be uh, going into details about this. Um, so I want to kind of focus more on a very practical, okay, let's get it done. Let's take an application and port it aspect than the bigger picture. Fair enough. Um, so the next couple of minutes, we will quickly have a look at the current state of Qt6. Um, then how what it takes in terms of build system and CMake integration to port an application to from Qt5 to Qt6. And uh, also the C++ side was already hinting at containers and so on. What does that mean for me, for my application uh, and tooling available to help you with the transition. So yeah. Q6.0 got released last December, uh, which I was personally quite happy about because it was actually, you know, almost or very near the original scheduled date. If you look big, big into Qt history, that wasn't always the case. So I think we did a good job there. Uh, early on in Q6, though, we already decided that we kind of can't cope with porting all of the Qt5 modules to Qt6 at the same time. You know, Qt has been growing over the years. Um, and, you know, it's just, 
know, from the timing and quality and effort perspective, very challenging to kind of tackle all these modules uh, with the existing people working on it. So um, we said with 6.0, we want to kind of port the most the most important modules, the modules we consider most important, um, and then quickly follow on in minor versions to all support more. So that's what you see here. Get 6.0, there was already quite some modules in 6.1 that's uh, released in May. We did do a couple of minor uh, ports and another big chunk uh, will happen with 6.2. And um, there is this saying now that, and you often read people that saying, learn now 6.0 is for this reason alone, just technical preview and you can't use it and so on. I don't agree. Uh, I think the quality of 6.0 and 6.1 is actually, uh, is, I mean, there's always things to improve and I'm not saying there is any kind, not any regressions, but uh, also looking a bit in history, I think it's actually fine. Um, we're doing, have been doing a good job there. The community has, has been doing a good job there. Um, and um, yeah, but obviously if you depend on Kit Multimedia, I think was raised yesterday in the chat and the discussions, um, then you might, need to wait until 6.2, which is currently scheduled for September. So the very first thing you might want to just check out is kind of the list of dependencies you have uh, and check what the state is there. So with that in mind, let's move to the build system. So very practically, I assume you're using CMake. You're having an application that's working fine with Qt5. What do you have to do to port it to Qt6? So um, yeah, I mean, this is typical API that you will see in Qt5 uh, with Q, uh, applications building against uh, Qt5. So um, CMake, you start usually with a find package and actually saying, you know, what actually I want, like in this time it's Qt5 with Qt widgets. Um, then um, you have um, APIs like uh, where you, directly might want to call functions that are provided by uh, the Qt modules. They usually start with the Qt5 underscore. Um, and in the end, you're also using the targets that were imported uh, by the find package um, to, for instance, link against Qt widgets. And again, you have a big Qt5 there. So you can already see that if you compare it, for instance, to C++ API, the CMake API is very versioned. Um, which is not a big problem for a very straightforward port because you know you can just go on and mass replace Qt6 with Qt5, uh, sorry, Qt5 with Qt6, maybe in a separate branch, and uh, suddenly you're golden. And that's really how it works, right? So um, we haven't changing much in the names of modules and so on. Um, there might be some smaller things, uh, but overall, um, there, there, there isn't that much changes in the CMake API uh, compared from Qt5 to Qt6. So most of the things will just work. Anyhow, this has a problem in that you are now having two different um, versions. And um, unless you really want to kind of, I don't know, do a one-off port or so, um, you often have the requirement that you want to support Qt5 and Qt6 at least for some time by the same code base. So what do you do there? We had a look, we had problems ourselves. Um, so we already in 5.15, we have been looking into this So and added some new API. So that's a very canonical solution if you want to support only Qt5.15 and future Qt6 versions. Um, so what has changed here? First of all, you might notice that there is two different find package calls. What's that? So the first call is actually using uh, the names uh, argument from find, uh, find package, which is hope I don't think that often used, but the idea here is that uh, I tell CMake to look first for Qt6 package. And if that fails, and for instance, the widgets are not found, then look for Qt5 package definition. And you know, CMake has all this kind of a bit weird <laughs> ways to locate packages. So um, that that sounds, but that sounds exactly like you want, right? We want to say first Qt6 and then Qt5 um, and uh, and then work with that and store that into a component, uh, uh, sorry, a package called Qt, uh, Qt in this case. That should be enough, but to be honest, it doesn't work out of the box because for instance, even from the auto RCC inside or auto mock was it, I think, uh, inside um, uh, 
uh, CMake support doesn't work with that. So it expects that the package is called Qt6 or Qt5. So what to do there is basically just using that first call to basically determine the major version that's stored into a, a CMake variable called Qt underscore version underscore major, and then use that argument to actually load the real thing so that we are having, again, a like defined package Qt5 or Qt6 here. So that's straightforward. Uh, another change you see here is that we are, have been actually calling something, a function here that is the CMake function that's defined by Qt without a major version. So not Qt5 underscore, but just Qt underscore. So that's an alternative API we've been adding in Qt 5.15 for all the functions that are exposed by the Qt modules to kind of help in the porting. And that's actually also true for targets. So you can also just refer to Qt underscore underscore widgets. And it doesn't matter with its uh, uh, target imported by uh, Qt 5.15 or Qt 6. So yeah, the big thing to remember here that that's API that we only added for 5.15. So if you want to support even older Qt versions, um, like Qt 5.14, um, then it looks a bit more complicated, but still manageable. So in this case, you can't rely on the unified function names. So you know you have to basically always do the, uh, the checking, am I Qt5 or Qt6? Um, and also the targets. In this case, you can just use the um, Qt version major variable as a, as a target. Good. What else to remember? Well, I already hinted that Qt6 is requiring C17. So that might be a good idea to check whether you are also requiring that. Or maybe you're already requiring a new version. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good check to do that you may, might also want to bump your C++ uh, standard requirements. And the last thing about CMake that I want to mention is that there is a new uh, module uh, called uh, Core 5 Compat. And the name says it all. It's a uh, class, uh, sorry, a library uh, uh, module which contains some of the API that we removed from uh, Qt 6 core specifically. So um, for any non trivial port, there's a good chance that you actually want to include that uh, thing too. Obviously, only if you compile against Qt6. But we will come to examples about this in a second. So the summary goes, yeah, my recommendation is uh, for commands that you want to use from Qt. If possible, just use the uh, unversioned ones. I think we should go on with them and actually use make them default. So then, for instance, the Qt6 to Qt7 port won't have that problem anymore. Um, the alternative also for uh, targets is to use just you know check or uh, embed Qt version major uh, variables so that you can support both Qt5 to Qt6 uh, and the C++17 requirement that I mentioned. Good. To be honest, I'm like, I don't hear anything. I'm not even sure whether people listen. <laughs> so uh, maybe that's a good point where if there's already questions. All good. OK, good. Then I will just go on. So yeah, um, so this is about basically assuming that you're having a more traditional application and uh, you want to port it, then doing the build system change. And then you most likely will run into still some comp compilation issues. Um, so that's somewhat to be expected. Um, but obviously, what exactly it is depends high, largely on the application. So. Um, what we have as a test bed, what we can have, offer as a case study is actually Git Creator. So um, Git Creator is our IDE. It's actually a large application. It uses a lot of the modules in Qt, though, I mean, obviously, it's like, you know, 
for instance, Qt Multimedia, I think, is not used. So there is exceptions. It's a certain type of application. So you have that problem always with case studies. Anyhow, it's, uh, I think, a good good, good idea to start looking into that. So what we did is all the quite early in the Qt 6 development to try to make the current creator code base compile also with Qt 6. Um, so that we can you know, learn from it. Uh, also, we provided feedback so that, for instance, some of the changes weren't done or were reverted and so on. So um, that's kind of uh, also the role of Qt Creator to be a bit like the, 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 the test case there, um, if changes are acceptable or not. Um, so I set the same code base, so it was not kind of a one-off branch or anything like that, uh, but we always want to support multiple uh, major, uh, sorry, multiple Qt versions with Qt Creator. And, uh, you know, uh, Qt 6 is not an exception to that. So in that sense, it went on a bit in parallel with the normal development of Qt Creator. Uh, what we did, though, very early on is uh, kind of trying to collect all the changes that are somewhat related to the Qt 6 board into one item in the bug tracker. So if you want, you can look it up. We're talking about roughly 180 patches there which sounds a lot, but on the other side, you know, most of them are also very small and so on. So it was like, you know, there was no big, I mean, I convert everything to Qt6 um, commit, uh, but rather, you know, module by module and case by case or in, all, in a lot of cases. Um, so what I did as preparation of this talk, I was actually kind of, you know, going through the list and trying to categorize the things a bit more. Um, to see actually whether there is patterns and the, you know some of the things was obvious, but some of the things even surprised me a bit. Um, so that the result of this is on the right side. So um, yeah, I was basically going through the patches and saying, okay, this one was solely for fixing Q-linked list, for instance. This one was affecting also, I don't know, some other uh, use case. This one was for regular expressions or regex. So uh, what you can see here is a bit of a pattern that, yeah, there is like the bar, largest bar that's QVECXP. Um, I will, for the most important parts, I will have follow-up slides. So we will look into this. Qstring QCharref is another case which might be interesting. Then there is a whole set of things, um, you know, around containers. So let's also have a look at that. And uh, the second largest one, I don't know, my other is obviously <laughs> a bit of a of a uh, basket for everything, but replace API deprecated in Qt5. That was actually uh, something that I can kind of uh, recommend in general. So um, if you want to port your application to Qt6, the best thing probably to do is first port it to Qt515 if you are not building with Qt515 yet, and actually deprecate, uh, sorry, fix all the cases where you have API that, uh, and use API that's already de uh, deprecated in Qt 515. So if you haven't done that already, there is a nice uh, uh, define called Qt disabled deprecated before. And in this case, you know, that's uh, hex for 5F, five, uh, five that's 515. So it says Qt remove all, or rather precompiler, remove all the, uh, declarations of API that is deprecated in Qt 5.15, and then you will get compile errors if you're using them still. So yeah, I can only recommend that because that catches already a lot of cases. So, um, but let's look into some more interesting topics probably than you know, uh, just smaller deprecations because what, a lot of them are really straightforward um, and the documentation usually just tells you what to use instead. So uh, QRECXP, that was the largest bar, if you remember. So what about that? QRECXP is the way to handle regular expressions from Qt4 to Qt5 times, basically. So um, yeah, the class uh, is heavily used in Qt Creator, um, which is, you know, might be a bit expensive. IDEs are all about text manipulation and so on. So uh, that might not be a complete surprise. And um, we've been using QRECX exp heavily in hundreds of uh, places. Um, but uh, already in 5.0, there was a replacement for QRECX. Exp so Q we were, a Q regular expression was introduced back then. So um, 
Yeah, but we never managed to do the port. Basically, we had cases where we had queue regular expression, but we had also lots still of cases where we had queue regular expression. Um, one of the reasons might be well, it was just working, all right? <laughs> Fix uh, code that just works. Um, the other one is that. Um, the porting is it's not just a single you know text replace so that's a bit like if you know the architecture of QRECX a bit um, it is uh, both a representation of the regular expression but also for instance a representation of the results so it was a bit of a mixture there um, and with QRECX expression we've been splitting up into that into two classes Q regular expression and Q regular expression match. Um, that's one of the examples, and there is, you know, a few more uh, in that regard. Um, one thing there's kind of a bit of a gotcha. That's why I'm mentioning it. Is that, for instance, also the wildcard syntax is not exactly the same. So Q regular expression uses a different backend for that. And um, in general, it has more feature. It has more features, uh, more advanced features, handles Unicode and whatnot. Um, but uh, it's also a bit stricter. So you might have a regular expression that is working as a string. Uh, you pass it to regex, and it's not working anymore with Q regular expression. That's not very often. I mean, the, you know, the common set of regular expressions are the same. But if you're using some, you know, some features and relying on some more like you know obscure details, then you might hit that. The problem with that is your compiler won't find it, right? It's just a string to the compiler, so you don't get a nice compiler warning. You get just different behavior or crashes even, uh, depending on uh, on the result of this. So that's a bit of a gotcha. Remember, maybe checking the regular expression and maybe putting a bit more effort into checking that it still works as expected. Um, that's also true for another case, uh, which is kind of using not actually Perl regular expression, but wildcards like you're using from the shell. So also there, uh, Q, okay, QRecX had directly supported this. QRecular expression doesn't, but it has a static function which you can call to convert a wildcard expression into a regular expression. Um, that works also, uh, but there is also some smaller details to remember. For instance, when it comes to slashes in the in the string and so on. Um, these are all, by the way, very nicely documented in the porting guide. So uh, if you want to know details about this one, I would actually recommend going to the porting guide. Um, I just want to mention another kind of difference, slight difference, which is a bit annoying. It's like that you had QRECX match length. And OK, I just see an error. It's actually QRECX expression captured length. And these sound like almost identical, but the return value, for instance, for the case where there was no uh, captures is different. So in the one case, it returned minus one. In the other one, it returned zero. That's an example. It's a bit unfortunate if you kind of you know, just mass replace things and suddenly things break, don't break anymore. Uh, sorry, don't work anymore. So again, I have to say we had lots of cases of QVAC exp in Qt5. Um, uh, sorry, in Qt Creator, and most of them are really straightforward to to port. Um, I would, yeah, I could open now the browser, but I'm not exactly sure how this works here in this uh, in uh, in this chat. So, um, if you are interested, we can also look it up later. It, that should be it for QVACX. So remember a bit to take special care there that actually it works the same as before. Another of these cases is QStringRef. So what is QStringRef? It is an optimization that you can do already in Qt five times, maybe even Qt four times, I don't remember, um, where you want to have a look at, you want to analyze a string, a QString, um, and you want to kind of have parts of it, uh, for instance, for further processing, uh, but you'd want to avoid the overhead to kind of copy and paste that because QString will then allocate a completely new object and so on, and when that might be expensive. So QStringRef is an optimization for that, um, which was is available in certain certain classes um, and of Qt and is exposed there, and um, you know you could use it to work with substrings basically of, of, of underlying strings. So being again an IDE, Qt Creator was using also making use heavy use of that. 
Um, what happened now is that in Qt 5.10 already, so already like you know a couple of versions ago, um, uh, there was a proposal for an alternative API, which is considered superior. That uh, goes under the name QString View. The very same concept, a bit of a different implementation, and also much more generalized. So QString Ref was only really working for QStrings. QString View you can also use for, I don't know, standard 16 strings and so on. So it's a bit decoupled from the QString implementation. Um, and it's also now a way, uh, available in lot, lots of other API, like in Qt Core, where uh, you know, QString Ref had, was kind of limited. Uh, uh, in terms of Qt API that's exposed there. It, there's also, for instance, now also a Qt byte array view and so on. So the concept is a bit more generalized. So in general, um, uh, it's recommended to use that. And that's the reason why we removed QString ref from Qt core. It moved to Qt 5 Compat. Um, but the problem is that, again, uh, the API, you're not using often QString ref alone, but you're using it with some API that exposes it. So in Qt, and these APIs also can. So it's time to port. Um, that's at least what we did in Qt Creator. Uh, um, small gotcha there, again, not that common, but there is a bit of a different behavior when you're using a view on a string and then change the string underneath. So it might be obvious that that's not a good idea to do. <laughs> And uh, the, pro the thing is that QString ref was trying to fix a couple of cases there, um, while QString view does not. So again, we had one case, I think, in Qt Creator where this led to a crash, just to let you know. On with containers. So something that's a bit annoying, I have to say, is QHash versus QMultiHash. So a Q hash, right? You know the structure. It's a key value thing, and uh, the uh, the container is optimized for looking up uh, the value by key. Um, and um, then there is also the idea to have that also as a multi hash, which means that there is one key, but there might be multiple values. So in Qt five, that was a bit of a weird setup because there was Q multi hash, but actually the implementation was in QHash, and you could actually use QHash as a, so Q, multi-hash was derived from QHash, was added convenience functions, but the implementation was, or the logic was in QHash, and you could use a QHash as a multi-hash by just using explicit API, like insert multi. So it was a bit of a mix of concepts, and in Qt6 it was decided to split it up and have two template classes, QHash and QMultiHash, which I think makes complete sense, but if you're porting, you might have cases where you have having uh, a QHash in your API and you actually have to decide, was it meant to be a multi-hash or not? So in that way, it's now more explicit, but uh, that's something that you can't kind of automatically decide. Obviously, if you have a header file somewhere and it takes a QHash, uh, then you have to decide whether it should be rather a multi-hash. So, no, that's that's one of the things where uh, you know which you can't just automate by search replace. Um, the other thing again is like, and I think that's now a common pattern if you see that that also the implementation of uh, QHash and QMultiHash changed a bit uh, from a node-based approach to a two-stage lookup table. So interesting topics if you're into that. That uh, the button line is obviously it should be faster by now. Uh, but it also has some implications in terms of reference stability. So if you have a hash and you take a reference or a pointer to, for instance, a value, and then you change the hash, uh, then uh, that will, well, I have to say crash more often. Uh, so, I mean, even in Qt five times, that was a bit problematic, but it was usually working and, you know, you shouldn't rely on that, but, you know, uh, that's how it is. Uh, you write code and it works and you keep it. So we had one case there or two cases, I think, where we had to adapt our implementation. And the solution was to actually go to standard unordered set in this case, because a standard unordered set has this explicit guarantee that you can have a reference and it will only be invalid if you, the item itself is deleted or the value itself or the key value part pair itself is deleted. So that might be no, an option tank to use.
Now, if you're into containers and have been following the discussion, I don't know, just a bit, then QList might have come and QVector might have come to your, uh, to your attention. So the problem with QList was twofold, or is twofold, maybe. <laughs> Um, the first one is that it had a very interesting implementation in that it tried to be clever whether the elements of a list would be allocated um, like continuously in the memory or whether the memory allocated for QList vector uh, QList is just an indirection and you know um, and points to to somewhere else uh, in memory and uh, QList had some you know, try to be clever and determine what you want and what's best for your use case. Uh, turns out that very early on, people pointed out that this is you know, not always work for creating the right results and that we should rather use QVector, which was added as a very explicit way to say, okay, it's always one continuous block of memory and the elements are in there, which uh, you know, is, is, is faster in terms of memory access. So if you iterate over things, then that's usually the, the preferred thing. Um, all right, so then there was discussion about what to do in Qt6. That, that was one problem, so weird memory model. And the other problem was that there is uh, the STD library, which unfortunately has different names or the same names for different concepts. So they also have a list, but it was actually, uh, they have a list and a vector, and QVector is standard vector, but QList wasn't, you know, standard list, but was something in between. So there was quite some discussion how to solve this. Um, the, one of the ideas was to, I don't know, deprecate QList and just live with QVector. The thing is, QList is everywhere. It's in every, it's in a lot of, I mean, there is hardly, well, I'm all exaggerating, but it's arguably the most used class of uh, Qt, um, maybe in, in line with QString. So uh, changing such a fundamental thing and deprecating it would be really kind of the mere definition of a source uh, compatibility break. So we decide not to do that in the end, but instead adapt the implementation of QList to be more or less that what QVector was previously. So um, yeah, that's what happened in Qt6. So if you have still fights with your colleagues about whether to use QList or QVector, the good news is you can stop now because you can say in Qt6 it's all the same. QVector is now a type def to QList. Um, and yeah, you might imagine that's quite a fundamental change. Uh, to be honest, to my surprise, in Qt Creator, we barely noticed. So there might be performance improvement in some cases, performance degradation in other corner cases. Uh, but to be honest, kind of in the overall thing, it really didn't show up too much. So um, that port was actually quite quite forward, uh, except that you, if you are really into pre-declaring everything, like in the headers for optimizing compile times, then you have a problem because Q vector has been changing. Uh, so it's it's not it's not its own class anymore. So yeah, um, another word about reference instability, you know. Might notice the theme now. QList for bigger for 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 certain types that were large enough, uh, and actually, you know, you could take a reference and to an element, and because it was at a different uh, memory location, you could change the vector. Uh, sorry, the QList and the reference was still valid. Not true anymore with uh, QList and Q6. So if you are if you're having a case where you I don't know have that problem, or anyhow you are disagree that actually the new implementation is better than the cop out is to go to standard list uh, because that is always this uh, structure where you have the elements are stored separately in memory um, and if you're using qlink list that was also one where we noticed okay qlink list is actually standard list from their concept here it's rarely used at least in Qt creator and Qt. so we uh, was we just decided okay let's you know move it to Qt 5 compat Again, you can find it there, but uh, to port it actually, just use standard list. Good. Um, yeah, the summary is that porting is mostly straightforward. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it might not meet, appear from the slides that you showed, but I was kind of after showing you the exit. The, the interesting things. So most of the patches of the 100 
80 whatever patches that I had was actually quite straightforward. So don't get confused by by these by these foot footnotes basically that I'm bringing up here. Um, and yeah, the recommendation is port to Qt 515 fixed deprecations. Then you know moving to Qt 6 should be actually quite straightforward. But what exactly you're affected with is obviously depends on your much on your application. So um, we were looking to Kai user feedback, for instance, and there it's mostly Q hash. I mean, it's also just a couple of things, but uh, sorry, there was Q variant. So Q variant was uh, got a lot more stricter and so on. Uh, so um, what we really try to do, and what all I'm telling you is probably documented in the documentation. So there is a porting guide on docu.io that you can go to. And uh, there is also separate pages for every single module, uh, like Qt Core, like Qt GUI, and so on, where the things are kind of explained. And we try to be uh, be really thorough with that to, um, yeah, to help you there. So it's a good idea to either directly read that thing or at least bookmark it if you are actually doing the porting. And um, yeah, we also much appreciate feedback about this one, to be honest, because I think. Now is the time to really, you know, cover all the uh, things and so on that people can benefit from it. So, yeah, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, I've been saying a lot of times that it was a lot of mechanical things. So the obvious question is, can't we automate this? And we had the same idea and actually uh, worked uh, together with Gatup and the KDE community uh, on Clazy. So if you haven't used Clazy or yet, it's I think originally created by Kdup, a tool that is built around Clang and allows like these code transformations, so code checking and code for transformations. And um, what the latest version, which is I believe 1.9, um, features now at least these four uh, fixes. So these are not so crazy. The call crazy had a lot of fixes and checks, uh, but they are split up a bit into this is really kind of everybody should use that. So it's in the default set of things to be checked. And then there is kind of manual uh, fixes. So that's uh, that's the category of manual fixes. So if you just run crazy without any arguments, you don't get them. But if you're into starting a port, then be aware that there is crazy checks uh, for yeah header fixes uh, when header changed. Uh, forward fixes, uh, that was actually also quite often that you, um, I don't know, um, some some header was included by some other header, which is not the true, true anymore. Uh, QHash signature uh, is another one, size T versus int and so on. So I can only recommend to use that. Um, and we'd like to have feedback actually about this because to be honest, we didn't receive so much about this. So that means either people are perfectly happy with it or which I doubt, or um, you know, uh, they haven't discovered it yet. So talk to us. Tell let uh, tell us what you think about this one. I think that's it. Hey, thanks so much. Well, we have reached time, unfortunately, but you do okay. have a list of questions. I'd love to invite you to the Matrix channel. Okay. to answer some of those questions in chat if you have some time. Sure. Yeah, I'll be there. Great. Well, thank you. I will connect with you also off screen to make sure you're able to get all of the, the list of questions, too. So uh, just ping me, and we'll get you all set. Cool. Thanks a lot, and have fun. Thanks. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of the day. You too.